Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our training for today. My name is Christy Smith. I'm Communications Outreach Manager here at Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service, and I'm very excited to introduce you to Carol Volandia. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Okay, great. So I'm going to give you a brief background on her, and then we're going to launch into the training. So Carol is the founder and CEO of Equal Access Language Services. She's originally from the country of Colombia, where she developed her skills in negotiation and conflict resolution. She emigrated to Baltimore in 2003 to become a social worker, an interpreter, a teacher, and an entrepreneur. She has integrated her passion for social justice, conflict resolution, language, and culture into the vision and mission of the company. She currently serves as adjunct faculty for the graduate program in interpretation and translation at the University of Maryland College Park and for the master's program in social work at University of Maryland in Baltimore. She previously performed as assistant professor in the MBA program at the University of Raja Khiri in Kerala, India. I hope I didn't put that too much. much. <laughs> um, so Carol is the creator of Languages and Equalizer Trainer. She's a certified healthcare, state, and immigration court interpreter and a conference interpreter. Her professional interests encompass culturally and linguistically appropriate services, language access, healthcare equity and social justice, and negotiation and conflict resolution. While in school, Carol's research explored the effectiveness of language access and healthcare outcomes and patient safety. Her current interest in this field is to improve access to public services by the limited English proficient population by reducing discrimination on the basis of language and increasing cultural competence as it applies to language access services. She is a firm believer that language, as the most important tool of communication, should be used to equalize people, improve interactions, and build peaceful relationships among diverse communities. One of her most important contributions in the field of language services was her video called Saving Lives in Many Languages, which won first prize in the National Patient Safety Summit held at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 2013. The video is now part of Johns Hopkins' The Promise of Medicine campaign. And we are just so excited to have Carol here today leading this training for us. So with that, I will turn it over to her. Thank you, Christina. I am very excited to be here sharing uh, my passion with everybody. <clears throat> we have two hours and I am going to make them as fruitful as possible. So <clears throat> with that, I want to start. Oops, you have to um, just click on the screen and then you'll be able to. Ah, here, okay. So um, this is basically how I conceive language services. There are three components of language services, the person that speaks another language, the provider of the service, and the interpreter. <clears throat> um, so the ob objectives of today, I hope, is that you can understand the background and, and needs of the limited English proficient population that you can understand the relationship between language and justice, that you can establish interpret, interpreters' role in public services, and understand interpreters' code of ethics, understand linguistic and other requirements in order to be an interpreter. This is all important because um, many professions in the public services arena are going to interact with uh, interpreters at many points because uh, we have a great population that is limited English in the United States. So um, what I wanted to show in this graphic is that it's hard to uh, work uh, with both interpreters and limited English proficient population. Um, in general, it's kind of like we don't know what to do with them, with, uh, with either the interpreter or the LEP for short, uh, for limited English proficient, the short is LEP. And we really kind of like, with what do we do with it? So. Um, the best approach is to incorporate a language services as part of your practice and by um, language services I mean interpreters and translators that are two different professions that often get confused. <clears throat> I like to start with a quote by Nelson Mandela that says, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. So let's talk about the population that you uh, are likely to work with, uh, the LEP person. The LEP simply means limited English proficient, and, it, and it's defined as someone that is unable to communicate effectively in English because the primary language is not English. So they speak and understand English less than very well. 
Approximately 81% of the LEP are born outside of the United States. 50% of immigrants are limited English proficient, and not all of the immigrants are LEPs. And 9% of the US population of 25.3 million people, uh, which is similar to the population of North Korea or Cameroon, are LEP. And these are um, a fact from the last census. So I think today we will have a much bigger number. However, I'm going uh, to play safe here and, and uh, cite the number from the last census. They often absent, uh, are, uh, they don't have formal education, which um, plays also a role in the communication with uh, any of their providers. They are usually below the poverty line and they have a very, very limited access to insurance or any kind of public service for many different reasons. 94% of them live in metropolitan areas and uh, they work high risk jobs and they are also undocumented. So they have many, many barriers that affect them. Because as you know, if you, um, um, if you are undocumented, you have less access to a lot of the public services provided. And this is just to emphasize how the pyramid looks uh, with the LEP and the immigrants. So 42.4 million immigrants in 2014, uh, this uh, immigration number is 25.3 million that are limited English. And, uh, but out of this limited English, there are 4.8 that are um, limited English, that are born in the, born in the United States. So we have about 60 million uh, US um, Americans that speak more than one language. In the US, we speak about 350 languages, and again, uh, 25 million required language assistance. So let's think about, um, and this is sort of providing a profile of the LEP person, right? Most of the LEP person that you're gonna see, and it all depends on um, where in the United States, but um, Spanish is the big language or the biggest number, and um, this is for the Latin born LEP population. And for the foreign born, Spanish is again the biggest language. There are other languages that we can mention in uh, the, na the native born is uh, where we have German, Chinese, French, Vietnamese, Yiddish, Italian, Hmong, Korean. And uh, for the foreign born, we have Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog, Russian, Arabic, Creole, Portuguese, and Polish, and 15% of other languages. So if uh, one of the, the reasons why I um, uh, became interested in this topic was because I worked for 10 years at, at Johns Hopkins and it was um, very touching or, or it was incredible to me really that to, to think about all the things that people that uh, don't speak English go through before they even step their foot on, uh, at the hospital. So they are often um, victims of human trafficking. They, are, uh, they have experienced poverty and violence in their countries and they get here, they are very likely to experience violence and poverty again, and then they get sick. So when they came to the hospital, they have gone through a lot of um, previous uh, issues that made them who they were. And then they come to the hospital and the least uh, one can do when they get when they got sick was to provide language assistance or at least that's how I saw it. So it became um, in my mind a, a really um, conflicting issue because um, it it put all of the previous um, victimization sort of in perspective and and uh, made me feel like oh my god this is the least we can do is provide adequate access to language so that they can understand what what they are experiencing, experiencing in their lives when they are sick. And I think this applies to all the other public services, uh, justice, education, not only healthcare. But a lot of my examples are, are healthcare related because that is a, the biggest experience and also where the field of language access is most developed. Um, and again, this is, uh, how our population, our LEP population looks, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, or uh, people with visas that are for trafficking or for uh, violence. The other aspect that they 
face or the other challenge that they face is the kind of work that they do. Um, why is this important? Because often the LEP population work high risk jobs. If we see this graphic, um, most of the women work in service occupations and most of the men work in um, construction and maintenance occupations. So when um, I go to interpret for workers' comp, guess, guess uh, the population I see are often people that have gotten injured. So the fact that they work high-risk jobs uh, adds a level of complexity to the LEP population. And um, these are some of the language that we have here in Maryland. Um, this is just a list, I'm not gonna go through them, but I just want to uh, bring up this, the, the issue that some of these language, languages are um, from places where we assume, for instance, that Spanish is spoken, like let's say Quechi is uh, one language from Central America. And um, just to, uh, again, uh, give you a, um, an idea of the diversity and, and a variety of languages that we have just in Maryland. Again, this is simply important because we need to um, make sure that we match the person with the right linguistic service. So since um, most people uh, looking at this uh, presentation are uh, lawyers, right? Uh, attorneys. There is an assumption that you are uh, here to serve people, right? And that um, and law is just one of the public services. So I, um, and the fact that you are even taking this training is because you care. <laughs> so um, I like this quote by uh, Theodore Roosevelt, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, when it comes to language, uh, people are going to open up when you provide adequate language services, right? And we are going to see how the, these adequate language services looks like. Um, in my experience working for, for Johns Hopkins for, for, um, for many years and working in the different courts, I have experienced how uh, people just open up, are able to speak and, uh, and communicate with, their, with, the, with the person providing the service. So, um, you know, I have I have seen it in different in different contexts, and it really makes a difference uh, in their outcome. Because what I think the focus should be is what are the outcomes for the people that are uh, unable to communicate in English. So just by by showing interest in language services, you are showing that you care. So public services are many, and um, they are defined as service offered or controlled by the corporate government that are important for quality of life and that are not driven by profit. So the main ones, but these are just the uh, main ones because there are really many, are legal, education, and healthcare. But there is also uh, you know, police services, firefighting, church. There are many other public services that are not profit driven. So we're going to talk today about two of the main public services, legal and healthcare. I understand most people here are lawyers, but I also included some slides that, that um, show the situation uh, for language access in healthcare. So other kinds of public services that I wanted to show just as um, um, just to go through them without delving into them is that emergency services, public health, public safety, environmental protection, um, consumer protection, immigration, customs, economic development like tourism, transportation, infrastructure, social services, and uh, postal systems. What happens is that all the public services in the United States are covered by laws, right? So pretty much every single one of these public services here have some kind of mandate when it comes to language services. So what are those laws? Let's talk about it. I'm gonna move this chair. So when we talk within the context of providing um, language services with for, for people that are um, working with an attorney, 
why I, I, I pose the question, why do you think uh, other than communication, what law surrounds the provision of language services or what law uh, protects rather the provision of language, language services? It, we have the Fifth amended, Amendment that basically talks about due process of law. Basically, it is impossible to assure a due process of the law if you are unable to communicate with the person you are trying to defend. Similarly, when uh, with the, the Sixth Amendment, if, you, if the person has a, a right uh, to counsel, again, how are you going to um, ensure this, this right without the key element that it is communication in a language the person can understand? And then, and this covers all federal, I, um, my understanding, and I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but my understanding is that all, all of these amendments cover um, federal laws and federal regulations. And uh, for the state, we have the fourth amendment, which is equal protection of the law to everyone that um, is under the jurisdiction of the state. As far as uh, other public services, um, uh, like healthcare, for instance, we have Title VI that says basically that you have to, uh, that no, no person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So language uh, is not mentioned there, but national origin is a proxy for language. So Title VI basically says that if you are receiving federal funds for your programs, you are supposed to provide to, to not discriminate on the, on the basis of language. So it's very uh, broad, uh, Title VI. So if we see in this little tree that I, I put together, it's sort of the umbrella um, law. But underneath, um, we have Executive Order 13166 that covers an, a, a great variety of programs, not only healthcare, but all the programs that receive federal funding. Executive Order 13166 basically says that um, improving access to services for, for persons with limited English proficiency, meaning that you have to provide meaningful access to anybody that's limited English proficient. So Title VI, again, is very broad whereas a uh, executive order is much more specific and it provides a guideline to uh, programs and organizations on how to provide meaningful access. So I highly recommend as one of the, uh, as part of the toolkit that you are gonna take today that you um, read uh, the executive order because it, it tells you a, a specific aspect of how to apply Title VI, like for instance, um, it clarifies what are the responsibilities of your agency, establishes general principles for agencies that receive federal funding to apply and developing guidelines for services to individuals with limited English proficiency, and provides compliance standards. So, what is meaningful access? For instance, if you work, um, as, you, as you saw earlier, 94% um, of the LGBT population. Um, lives in a metropolitan area, right? So you're likely, if you have a program and you run it in the city, you're likely to have a big proportion of LP individuals attending your program. So uh, you have, um, you have a, a much bigger burden to provide a, a service than, let's say, in the middle of the field, right? It doesn't mean that they don't have to provide a linguistic service, it's that their linguistic service or their language access plan will look different than yours if you're in the city. So for instance, um, it has to be reasonable, meaning it has to be available. There are many ways to provide language access, and, and uh, one is providing an, an in-person interpreter, but there are other ways. You, have, you can do telephonic interpretation, video remote interpreting, those are other uh, forms of, of providing the service. The important thing is that you provide the service, right? The other aspect that you have to consider about your program is the frequency of contact with the program of the LEP person. So if, the, if you have, let's think for example, um, a zoo, 
and you might not see an LED person um, on a daily basis, right? Or, um, but a hospital in the city, let's say Johns Hopkins, they are likely to see um, LED persons every day. So they have to adjust their program based on the frequency of contact with the program. Also the nature and importance of the program. A hospital obviously have to have uh, more tools to provide language assistance than again a zoo or a park, a national park that also receives federal funding. So for instance, if we, you go to a national park, you might find translation of documents, but you might not find an, um, an in-person interpreter. It might seem a, an unnecessary expense also because the importance of pro, the program is much is, is less vital than, than a hospital, right? So uh, whereas in a hospital, you're likely to be, to be forced to have interpret on-site interpreters of the majority of the languages that are spoken around that area. And also the fourth consideration is what are your resources? So again, the burden is not going to be the same uh, for Johns Hopkins Hospital, let's say, that receives a great um, um, amount of money from the federal government from, through N NIH grants. It's not going to be the same as a small organization that receives perhaps uh, federal funding for a, a small program. So they might be justified to have other, you know, language access just to, through the phone and not hire an interpreter because their budget won't allow for to do that, right? So um, again, executive order is a great tool for you to uh, uh, craft your own language access plan based on uh, these these requirements. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to hold questions to the end? Or oh, you yeah, know, if anybody has a question, I feel like I'm, I'm I have a question. <laughs> um, so to your knowledge, is this order only applicable to healthcare or is it applicable to all types of organizations that receive federal funding? All types of organizations that receive federal funding because it says that um, the nature of the importance of the program, for instance, and it, and it includes, let's say, national parks. Okay. And um, anybody that receives federal funding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hospital is just one example of how, um, of one institution that has to go through all of this. Mm -hmm. So definitely they are looking into executive order 1216. Did that answer your yeah. question? Then, and this is more that this is definitely just specific to healthcare is the non-discrimination provision of the, Amer the Affordable Care Act that basically says that um, you can't discriminate. Oh, I'm sorry, let me just read. Prohibits healthcare providers, health insurance marketplaces, health programs administered by the Health and Human Services, and programs or activities that receive funding from the federal government from discrimination based on an individual's race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. So perhaps if you are acquiring your uh, service, your healthcare service through the marketplace, you're gonna receive a, a folding piece of paper that tells you that if you need an interpreter, you have to ask for one, etc. So that is definitely something that is new. Well, newish since 2010. Um, it's been implemented, and it's ex specifically the one five. Five seven provision, which clarifies more what is the um, a, the establishing rights laws and aligns the laws to specific areas of the Affordable Care Act, and the and and the thing is that holds the programs accountable. One thing that I want you to consider um, about the executive order is that. Um, Unfortunately, executive orders are, they come and go, right? This was established by President Clinton. We are hoping that it never goes away, but it's a, it's, that's the weakness of, a, of an executive order. So uh, in the language services world, we sort of want to hold it like, we don't wanna um, um, make too much noise with the current environment, we don't want to lose that piece of legislation that is what covers or that what provides most information about how to provide language access. Um, so again, the law, this law covers many agencies and most languages. Uh, the law requires the agency to provide a free interpreter. This is very important too. 
in any program that is covered by the federal government, um, you can never ask a person to provide an interview, right? It's the burden of the institution to provide one. Um, and also there is the second aspect of language services that is translation of vital documents. So if you go to a hospital and you are about to uh, go through surgery and you don't speak English, um, that a consent that you receive is likely to be translated in the main languages, right? Specifically Spanish. A lot of documents today, because of the population in, in Maryland and in Baltimore, uh, these documents are usually translated. So what are vital documents? Documents that, like for instance, an informed consent. Um, so this is important because often, and when we saw the first graphic about like, oh, we don't know what to do with the LEP, what I have seen that happens uh, frequently, obviously less and less, is that people ask the person to provide an interpreter, right? Because they don't know this, this aspect. Um, and often also the family member or the, or the, what tends to happen is that the LEP also feels self-conscious about not speaking English and they are likely to bring a family member or a person from the community to speak the language. Now, there is an important aspect about, about this because there are some instances where the language is so rare that perhaps one person in the community is the only person that is able to interpret for that, for that patient, let's say, right? So, uh, that goes into further level of complexity when, like, what do you do when, when, uh, when the language is, is uh, not Spanish or is not one of the most frequent ones, but a rare language. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in the future. Let me see if there are questions so far before I go to. I think the thing kind of will like flash oh, at okay. you if there's questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so if we go back to the little tree of how I conceive these different laws, we have that uh, then the Affordable Care Act, the state law, the state law, and there is class standards. And again, we are delving a little bit in healthcare, but I think the example that healthcare brings to other services is simply that uh, I think is where the field is much more advanced. So there are a lot of things that we can draw from, right? So the class standards, in my opinion, should be borrowed or adopted by a, other public services. Um, the principal standard of, first of all, what it means, class. Class means cultural and linguistically appropriate services. And the principal standard is to provide effective equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health benefits and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. So there are 15 standards, but there are only a few, a few for or that apply to language specifically. Before uh, I go into one of those standards, I wanted to show you a study and, um, and sort of bring the urgency of understanding how language has such an impact in healthcare. And if we extrapolate the experience from healthcare to other areas, it, it can really make a difference. So there was a study uh, in 2012, it was published, and there were 57 encounters with limited English proficient persons. Um, 20 were uh, co uh, conducted with professional interpreters, 27 with ad hoc interpreters. Ad hoc interpreters meaning um, a bilingual person that was providing interpretation for the person, and 10 with no interpreters. Out of these 57 encounters, there were 1,984 interpreted errors that were notated or noted, and 18% had potential clinical consequences. So this is how it looked. So as you can see here, 22% were errors ad hoc interpreting. It was better not to have an interpreter at all than to have somebody helping. And you know, um, in any human field, there is human error. 
but obviously prof professional qualified interpreters uh, represented only 12% of the errors. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Were um, a decent number of those ad hoc interpreters minors? The kids or mm, I, I didn't see that discriminated in the study, okay. uh, but they were ad hoc interpreters. Uh, and ad hoc interpreter again can be a, a, a person that is a staff member, yeah, a child. Okay. Uh, yes, and, and children should not interpret either, right? Right. And we're going to get to that also That's when right. we talk about uh, class standards. But this was pretty jarring. I mean, of those mistakes, if you see uh, English proficient, and I and they, the um, LEP fare worse in every every aspect of this chart, but I want you to focus on the extreme right severe temporary harm. I mean, one percent of those um, of the errors made was um, lethal or or severe temporary harm, I should say, uh, for the English proficient of any race, whereas for the LEP. It was four percent, so it was a seventy-five percent difference with, when compared to English. So I want you to meditate on this and to think about this. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story that perhaps will bring it home. Well, I, I'm, I want to tell two stories. One is the story of Willie Ramirez. Uh, he was an eighteen-year-old, eighteen-years-old patient in uh, Florida. He spoke Spanish. He was from Cuba, I believe. And he came to the hospital almost semi-unconscious. Semi His family was there. And the doctor didn't use a professional interpreter. The doctor used a family member to try to understand what was happening. And the word intoxicado was uttered. And the doctor said, oh, intoxicated. OK. So they said, oh, OK, so maybe he just had an overdose. He was uh, in drugs or drinking. And the family was like, no, he doesn't drink. He doesn't drink. He said, he's a He's a soccer player or, or he likes sports, he doesn't think. Anyway, the doctor just understood intoxicated and he went with it. And they put Willy Ramirez in observation. Uh, it took two days before they contact or they called that neurosurgeon to discover that he wasn't intoxicated. He had an aneurysm. But the problem I want to bring up is that the word is a false cognate. There are a lot of words in Spanish that sound very similar in English that are false cognates, like that one. So intoxicado in Spanish means food poison, and we already know what it means in Spanish. So if you treat a patient with, um, a, as if that person was intoxicated, you're likely to uh, provide the wrong treatment. So. The whole uh, point of doing this kind of, of uh, workshop is to understand that there are consequences. Language is a tool. Language is like a scalpel. And if you use the scalpel with a blindfold, you're likely to hurt people. So this is one example. The other example I wanted to, to cite uh, is the, exam the example of Griselda Zamora. She was a 13-year-old lady, a girl. And she was uh, very sick. The parents took her to the ER. She obviously was bilingual. She understood everything was happening, but she was also in pain. The parents didn't speak English. And uh, first of all, the, the bias that played here were like, okay, 13 year old from Mexico, stomach pain, probably pregnant. All right. She wasn't pregnant, uh, but the doctor sort of dismissed uh, her whole case because of this bias going on and because of the language barrier too. So the, guess who did they use to um, interpret to the parent? They use the patient in pain. So in the communication, the parents understood that they shouldn't bring Gris Griselda until the weekend had passed. And what the doctor meant to say was that they should bring Griselda if the symptoms didn't go away. Something happened in the communication. They waited, Griselda continued to be in pain. They were like, no, no, we should go, you know, we should go on Monday. And when, by the time they went back to the hospital, she had a developed peritonitis. What she had originally was an appendicitis, but because the language barrier and the different cultural biases that, that played, here, played a role here, uh, she wasn't taken care of appropriately and then she died. 
So just imagine the consequences of a language barrier. These, these are obviously terrible examples, but hopefully they don't happen to, to, um, to um, people as, uh, you know, as dramatic as these examples. But in general, for anybody that doesn't speak English, they experience longer hospital stays, greater difficulty understanding these charts instructions, and they are often readmitted for certain chronic, chronic conditions. So um, I saw some of this. These charge instructions are, are key for people to um, really not have to go back to the hospital. So if anybody's concerned about uh, the cost of uh, language services, they should be more concerned about the cost generated by lack of understanding and lack of compliance and then readmission to the hospital. So, and this applies to not only patients, but I, I would say that applies to everybody that works in public services. Usually lack of compreh comprehension uh, of their medical condition, treatment plan, discharge instructions, complications, follow-up, inaccurate and, and incomplete medical history, or if you think about, uh, let's say, an application for asylum, uh, we can apply there too. Ineffective or improper use of medications, um, improper preparation for tests and procedures, and poor or inadequate informed consent. So this all really applies to any kind of public service, just we have to change like the, instead of medical history, we can have a, an incomplete or inaccurate complete, um, like asylum application a, or improper pre preparation for a hearing. It can, you know, you name it. So that now we, we are going to see how can we um, tackle these this problems with uh, the LEP. The first uh, class standard that applies directly to, to language is that uh, first, language, is, uh, language assistance should be at no cost, timely access to healthcare and services. Now, I know that for attorneys, this might um, operate differently because as a, as, a, as a lawyer, you might be in a private practice. So in that case, you don't have to provide language interpret for free. Maybe there is a, a fee schedule there. It is when it, it applies to courts though. So if you go to the court, the court should provide um, an interpreter. In the immigration court, they should provide an interpreter. But perhaps in your uh, individual practices, obviously since you are not receiving directly <laughs> federal funding, then it's a, it's a different deal. So this is within the context of uh, organizations that receive federal funding, um, and uh, and that's where it, it needs to be free. The next standard uh, is uh, standard number six that you have to inform all individuals of the ability of language assistance services clearly and in the preferred language, verbally and in writing. Very important that is in writing too. That's why where you see that both translations, translators, and interpreters uh, interact. And again, um, this is a, a standard that applies uh, in hospitals and, and services of, of um, high risk, but um, it, it's a practice that can be adopted to law. And in fact, in every court, you also see a, a, a announcements or, or boards say that say if you need an interpreter you should notify the court. Uh, so how do we figure out that a person needs an interpreter? Because this is this is what happens usually. We think that the person understands because they nod, right? I, I bet that happens a lot. Like the person goes like uh, move their head and they say yeah uh, okay he seems to be understanding. But is it a good measure to uh, to um, just go by the person nodding their head, right? So how do you assess that? If the person requests an interpreter, if they, if, if they speak English as a second language and it is a stressful, complex, or unfamiliar situation, if it's difficult to understand, uh, when the person responds only in a limited way, um, if it relies on family or friends to interpret, if it wishes to communicate in his or preferred language um, or cannot grasp or respond to questions in English. Those are some aspects that you can um, keep in mind. But, the most, but, but then what else am I missing? What other thing we need to consider is 
how well I can understand and communicate in the, in the language of the patient. And this is where I um, invite people to assess their own language skills. I know a lot of people speak Spanish, and um, but the question is, how much Spanish do you speak? And if that Spanish, let's say Spanish, just to give an example, is understand is uh, is understood by the other person. So, class standards are trying to get people to test their own language skills because um, because you just don't know. I mean, you just you just don't know uh, how much of your Spanish is understood by the other person. And it is important that we take a, a um, that, that we are very humble about this and, and test the Spanish, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm thinking like, um, sometimes we have clients who, maybe for a number of reasons, like um, they tell us they don't want an interpreter. Maybe either it's because um, they don't want to trouble us or they feel embarrassed or like a number of different factors that might not be, be going on, but like we also feel like they might not have a full understanding they want they tell us they want to communicate with us in English but we we feel like maybe they're not fully mm -hmm. understanding us um you know we don't want to make assumptions like that someone can't speak English and right. they tell us that they can but I guess like how would you go about assessing yeah that so I, I think that uh, it's important to understand that, that not only they have a right but you have a right to understand too and have a right mm -hmm. in other words um, if communication is the main diagnostic tool or the way to provide due process in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, the legal field, um, you are uh, the other part of the interaction. So if you don't feel comfortable with the English they are speaking and you prefer to have an interpreter, mm -hmm. in my opinion, that is more, more culturally competent than not making the assumption that perhaps they are going to feel offended. Because I think in the hierarchy of different values, what you need to, to have uh, for sure is the process, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you might upset someone slightly for like, you know what, I really don't understand what you're saying. And that has happened in in, in, a, in healthcare, it used to happen. Oh no, I don't need an interpreter, the doctor. I would always wait uh, because the, the two parties have to dismiss the interpreter, at mm -hmm. least in the healthcare field. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the, um, Legal field, you know, it's it's a, it's a little different, but but usually the interpreter doesn't leave until they um, both come to an agreement that they can dismiss the interpreter. So if uh, the either the doctor, sometimes the doctor felt more comfortable with the interpreter there, and sometimes the patient felt more comfortable with the interpreter there. So it's either either or, but not a single. I mean, in the interaction, one of them is not enough to really say we don't need an interpreter. Mm -hmm. You need the two parts. So again, that that drawing from medicine. Does that help? Does that answer the question? And there are tools that I'm going to provide about assessing your own skills and keeping them sharp because the message is not you need an interpreter for every single interaction and, and sort of uh, uh, policing that. But the message is. If you're going to use a language, use it appropriately and know what you're using and know what your limitation is. Mm -hmm. Because part of the, the problem right now is that it's used indiscriminately. And people are like, oh, yeah, let's do Google Translate for these charts and instructions. And, and they use methods that are not vetted for certain contexts. Mm -hmm. They are very good. I mean, I, I think I, Google Translate has evolved tremendously, even mm -hmm. in the last year. I have seen the changes that they have done, right? Because there is always somebody checking. And they um, they use big data, they are able to combine context. So they are, they are very good. Uh, but I always try to flip the, the, the scenario. Okay, would you feel comfortable if they were, if you were in, let's say, China, and you were feeling sick and, uh, they were like, mm, let's put these instructions in, in, from Chinese into English and, and give it to you. It, it all depends on the level of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, let's say Google Translate is great, like if you are going touring and go to a bar and all that. But in high stressful situations, high stressful mm -hmm. situations, maybe it's not the best option. So it's just be cautious about it. So these are the tools I, I, I mentioned. One is the ILR, self-assessment, that is 
uh, very, oh, actually, can I do that? Maybe, you can try. <laughs> but it's in a website, yeah. yes. It should so, be connected to the internet. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If you remember these ILR self-assessments, it gives you uh, a list of things. So you can assess your own language skills. And you can also opt to an or, or you can assess the language skills of your staff members. Possibly because the PowerPoint's taking up the whole screen. If you do want to look yeah. at it, you might have to escape and hit, not just hit uh, escape. Okay. Um, so that it can see what's in the, it looks like it uh, opened on yes. the internet. Yes, yeah, it offered, excellent. Yeah. So it's this document, self-assessment of speaking proficiency, and it is very useful. <laughs> um, when I run my trainings, uh, I, I, um, I ask them to do the self-assessment or do the other, or be actually do, do the actual test. Uh, so there are different levels. If you are at a level, three, right, um, then it might be fine to communicate with your, with your client. So there are two different aspects. One is interpreting and one is just speaking directly to the client. The, um, the important thing that I want you to get from today is that being bilingual is great, and you can communicate with your client. You know, provided that you 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 uh, you don't face any language challenges with you know, any, any linguistic challenge with the person. But uh, that doesn't mean that you can interpret. So there are additional skills to interpret. I only mention this because it sometimes gets confusing. It gets confusing, and um, and and I've seen this happening where. Uh, People feel, oh, okay, I can interpret for this person. And I caution not to do that because there are all other, a whole um, um, but, or, or, or another list of skills that we're going to go through today that um, makes the difference between a bilingual person and, a, and, a, and, a, and an interpreter. So let's talk about that. So these are the two tests, right? Let me put the full screen again. So the class standard basically asks that people that are providing language assistance, recognizing that, that the use of untrained individuals or minors, this is where it says that, um, as interpreters should be avoided. So they recommend that you test your abilities. Why do you think minors shouldn't be used? <laughs> I mean, it could be traumatizing to them. Mm -hmm. They might not even understand some of the medical terminology or legal terminology. Or legal terminology, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, they might not have the vocabulary. They might not have the, they might get traumatized. And um, it is just a conflict of interest. Um, I saw situations, or I know of situations where a minor was uh, used to interpret for for her mother, his mother's breast cancer diagnosis, or an eye surgery. I mean, so in the legal field, uh, or in a school, sometimes they ask the child to interpret their own. You know, how 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 impartial can he be if the teacher is is uh, is basically um, saying something that is uh, not favorable to the kid, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, of issues about minors interpreting. So minors at all costs should be avoided. Standard number eight is basically to provide easy to understand print and multimedia materials and signage in the language commonly used by the population in the service area. Again, I think it is not only applies to hospitals, I think the immigration courts are doing a little bit more signage, for instance. So, uh, yeah, these are just examples of confuse, confusing and good um, signage, right? So here we have to the right that there is translated in different languages. Okay, so now we can move on. Do you do you want to? It's kind of related, but do you want to take the the break? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay.
time and break. Um, yeah, okay, let's take a break. Okay, so do you know if there's a way to pause the broadcast? We just mute it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, so returning from our break, I wanted to show you uh, a video that was created by, by um, an organization called Fluency, and I'm going to play it. I'm so sorry. If she's been crying nonstop. She's a in the I don't know what to do. Not a big And be parolas in the sun. Please, just every time I hear she turns up. Be parolas in the sun. What are you saying? Can you just look at her? No, she's burning up. Are you parolas la anglan? What? He's burning up. Feel Tranquilly, 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 tranquilly. The mother is asking. What is he doing? What do you have? My my baby, she's got a temperature of 105. She every time I feed her, she throws up. Please, do, can you? Let's get a She's burning up. Feel her head. Don't rub it again. Please, just just feel her head. Feel her head. Just don't mean to say that. I don't think anyone understands what I'm saying. Please, someone help me. 8% of U.S. citizens speak limited English. Reactions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I think um, part of the, the, um, the reason why, why I became very interested in this topic is because I was one stick in South Korea and I could not understand what it was being spoken, it was very frustrating. And I imagine how it would be for all the, the people that that require assistance in, in, in um, for medical for healthcare or that are in a in an issue, you know, um, they got into an accident or something. So I like this video because it has a it flips this the script, right? Mm -hmm. the, the it's not LEP, but it's like limited blank mm -hmm. um, language right it, could you guess the language it was hard <laughs> it's esperanto um oh. it's esperanto so again i wanted to show that video because it sort of helps us uh flip the script and uh a, a help us put uh, ourselves in the position of the LEP. so um i think it is important that we know what what kind of professional we 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 need to engage uh, in order to provide adequate language services so i think that even though the interpreter and the trans interpreting and translations are uh, translation are two of the most the oldest professions they are very they are not very well understood they are understood uh, as it applies for for instance conference interpreter uh, but public services interpreters are not very common, or, or I shouldn't say they are not very common, they are common, but that profession is, is less understood than conference interpreting. We have been exposed perhaps more to conference interpreting, um, or at least the conception of, of an interpreter. So it is important to understand that it is a profession and that it has a code of ethics because that helps you um, interact with this person knowing what service they should provide. It's like going to the doctor. You you know that the doctor is supposed to abide by the hypocratic code of doing no harm. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't go to a doctor unless you trust that the doctor went to some kind of university that made that say, okay, this is a doctor and abide right. So I I think that the, one of the efforts is to make sure that it happens the same way interpreting. Um, and again, it's a profession that's old, very old, but it, uh, it is not professionalized in, in certain areas, like public services interpreting, for instance. Um, they are, they, there is no title, like this is a public service interpreter, but they have minimum requirements. And the most important requirement is that they abide by some kind of code of ethics, because then you can, uh, 
have certain, it's like an insurance. I think I see the code of ethics like sort of an insurance, right? Um, and I think that a profession cannot call itself a profession unless it has a code of ethics. Lawyers have codes of ethics, doctors have codes of ethics, codes of ethics, um, social workers, so why not interpreters? So the first thing that we expect from an interpreter is that they deliver the message accurately. So whatever is said from one part is conveyed to the other, right? It is important to make the distinction though be between accuracy and verbatim. This is a, a common request. Lawyers, doctors, everybody tell the interpreter, please interpret word for word. It's impossible to interpret word for word to be accurate because you have to interpret the meaning and not the uh, not the word. So, for instance, if I say, "Oh, you know what? That that should that was a red flag." If I were to interpret that into Spanish, it will I could interpret the, the word "red" exists in Spanish and the word "flag" exists in Spanish, but put together in this with the same meaning as in English means nothing in Spanish, right? So I will have interpreters ha will have to be accurate and find the, the cultural equivalent to that phrase. That is accurate. It will not be accurate to say red flag, bandera roja, right? So accuracy is the first standard or the first um, canon of, of ethics. Now, I also wanna make a clarification. There are many codes of ethics. There is one for the uh, courts, there is one for, for healthcare. And there are and and they are uh, they have variations. So, um, but I selected the National Code of Ethics from the um, from that is most widely recognized for uh, healthcare interpreters. Compare this code of ethics with the one that is um, um, issued for court interpreters, and they have a lot of similarities. So, I'm gonna go through the similarities. So, accuracy is definitely one that they share. The next one is, the, is confidentiality. The interpreter treats as confidential all information learning the performance of their professional duties while observing relevant requirements regarding disclosure. So this applies different also in, in healthcare. In healthcare in Maryland, uh, interpreters are mandatory reporters as well of child abuse and neglect. Um, and in those cases where the, the, the life of somebody is in threat, they are justified to perhaps uh, break confidentiality, but the most they can do is to, to uh, involve the social worker, let's say, and say, hey, I know this, right? So confidentiality applies to both legal, uh, in the legal setting and, setting and healthcare, but in the healthcare uh, field in Maryland, they are man mandated reporters. This caused a lot of controversy because um, with, with mandating reporting, because um, for some reason, most people don't feel comfortable uh, bringing up an issue, right? Uh, unless, especially if they are not a social worker or, or teachers, they might not feel confident that what they, they second guess reporting. Uh, but I, I, I bring this up is that. Uh, in, in Maryland, I think I think in Maryland everyone is a mandated reporter, but for sure healthcare interpreters. Lawyers are not actually. No, no, so that, not. I could see that being, you know, a concern or a question that people might have about working with Correct. an interpreter because lawyers are one of the only professions I think that yeah. is not a mandatory reporter. Correct. So this is where it's yeah. different. Uh, the code of ethics. Uh, so they, but they do both have confidentiality mm -hmm. in the legal field. They don't have this require regarding disclosure mm -hmm. they don't have that mm -hmm. but in, in healthcare they might be justified to do mm -hmm. that so whenever you hire an interpreter for any uh, um, legal uh, legal legally binding uh, kind of, of encounter that interpreter should follow the court interpreter guideline and not the healthcare guideline mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and you would you would do a lot of, I mean, it would be beneficial for you to even ask interpreter, which, you know, do you have a code of ethics, which one do you follow? Because mm -hmm. if they don't even have a clue, then you're like, mm -hmm. are you yeah. asking, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so confidentiality, for sure. Um, 
And just to clarify, this is not that they run amok and say, oh my God, I saw a bruise and now the child is in danger. No, the, as I said, the most they can do is to bring it up to a, a, another professional like, hi, uh, like a, a social worker or nurse in, in a healthcare uh, setting. And it works differently in, in a law. Impartiality also applies to both. The interpreter is trying to maintain impartiality and refrains from counseling, advising, or projecting personal bias or beliefs. Both have the exact same standard in, in the court and in healthcare. One important aspect about, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll get to that in a little, in a little while. Uh, professional boundaries, again, uh, they, they are perhaps, uh, the, the name in, in court interpreting uh, might be a little different, but it's about boundaries anyway. The interpreter maintains the boundaries of the professional role, refraining from personal involvement. So the, the interpreter is not the right to the patient or the, um, the person, I don't know what other things uh, might be asked from, a, from an interpreter, but I, I've seen how like uh, in hospitals, this line gets a little blurry because they might ask um, unadvertently the interpreter to perhaps say, uh, push the wheelchair from one department to another and the interpreter might do that. Uh, but they are not supposed to. So they are limited in what they can in what they can do. Sometimes because the language creates this familiarity with a patient, for instance, the patient might feel like, oh, can you hold my baby? And they can do that, right? Or they cannot help the nurse holding the patient. They are not trained to do that. They are, they are not insured to even touch the patient. Can I bring something up there? Yes. Um, so my past job was at a refugee resettlement agency, mm -hmm. and we used to always have the challenge with some of the more, the lesser well-known languages. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times the interpreters were actually like neighbors or friends, just because that language community was so small in any city that if two people spoke this not very well-known language, it was likely they knew each other already. Yeah. And so we were constantly trying to work around that one. Yes, I and mean, in for that, for some languages it's very hard. Yeah. Uh, because if it's the only interpreter in the community, this code of ethics might it's not that it doesn't apply to them, but it's more, more much more challenging because if yeah. you have to recuse yourself every time you have to uh, interpret for someone that you know and you're the only one in that community, and you're likely to know everyone. Right. So I guess you have a higher standard of confidentiality. I mean it's is a lot tougher, um, and this is conceived, you know, in, in in a context where there are multiple people, multiple interpreters. But that is a challenge. Yeah. Only one it's true. Um, but a lot uh, often, what happens is that interpreters that are abiding by the code of ethics are are read as oh, he's kind of friendly because they didn't uh, do one thing or another, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's that actually they are trying to abide as best as they can um, by their code of ethics. Um, we'll see some other things. So respect protocol and demeanor, this applies to both a uh, court and, and healthcare. The interpreter law observes the professional protocol within the context with which they are interpreting, court, hospital, church. And it refrains from, uh, it, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know, I misspoke there, but it, it uses the grammatic, the same grammatical person as the speaker, meaning if the speaker is, is um, saying, you know, I have, I had a car accident and I need you to help me, the interpreter is going to say exactly the same, I had a car accident and I need you to help me. It doesn't use the third person. So it's very useful to understand this because what you're looking, you, what you're aiming with, with having an interpreter is to actually facilitate the communication. So sort of forget about the interpreter and, and just uh, listen to the, um, the mode of, uh, they are using the, the first person and that way you can, the, the interpreter becomes transparent. In, in fact, I would say that um, the best interpreters are the ones that you don't even know right? The ones that help you communicate with your clients and are, are not interfering. Um, obviously, interpreters have to constantly uh, go to training and continue to 
develop their skills. Um, the, the professionalism aspect is that they have to ask professional and in an ethical manner. They uh, I have to adequately represent uh, their credentials. This is another thing that's going to be very helpful for, for you as an end user of interpretation services is that um, it's good to know what is out there, what are the certifications that you could be looking for so that you get the best service, right? So uh, I will talk uh, about certifications in a minute, but I want to put a sign of warning here because we're going to talk about a few canons that don't apply to courts, but apply to healthcare. Advocacy, obviously, in, only in healthcare. <laughs> so the two different settings, uh, the healthcare encounter and the legal encounter, are very different. In the healthcare encounter, everyone is rooting for the patient. It's a patient-centered approach. Whereas in, in legal, uh, in a legal environment, not necessarily. I mean, you might be interpreting for a deposition and anything that you can do can, can affect the outcome of that deposition, right? So advocacy is a big no for legal interpreters. Also, uh, in healthcare, is not recommended unless it's absolutely necessary. And this is the line that sometimes interpreters don't know how to walk that line because they meddle and they might do more things than they are they they should right they only are justified to advocate when the patient's health well-being or or dignity is at risk the interpreter might be justified in acting as an advocate uh, to support healthcare outcomes but what but what does it mean to be an advocate it simply means that you connect the person uh, or bring it up to the person that has as a profession to advocate in a, in a case, in a hospital situation, for instance, usually a social worker or somebody, they can go beyond the role and perhaps uh, recruit the help of somebody else. Uh, another instance where they might be justified, uh, one example was I, I was um, interpreting for a, for, a, for a person who mentioned a, in, in some, you know how when you go to the doctor, you might go through six different encounters before you see the, the actual doctor, right? You see the technician first, the nurse, a lot of people. And at some point she had filled out somewhere that she was pregnant when we, and she had some issue in her arm. Um, and then at some point uh, later in the encounter, a, a technician came to take her for, for x-rays. So for, I mean, those errors can happen. Would I have been quiet? Right? I shouldn't be quiet because even though privacy and all those other things are part of the code of ethics, um, bringing up the fact that she told me it, it, that she said before uh, that she was pregnant would have been appropriate because the, her, her, her baby's life is at risk. She is taken to the X and uh, the X-ray machine and she perhaps doesn't know the risk. So in those cases, you're justified. But um, part of the problem is that a lot of times interpreters act all the time as advocates and they and healthcare providers, they may like that or they may not like that because it's like encroaching in somebody else's role. So um, this particular canon is very tricky and, um, and the, 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 my, I lean towards the idea that if you interpret accurately, you have to le do less advocacy, right? Because if you're truly the voice of the person and if you are uh, using the same kinds of words, the same tone, everything, um, the person listening to, to the message is going to uh, um, receive all that, right? So one of the aspects of, of, advocacy, of um, sorry, accuracy is that you don't filter anything, right? And this is counterintuitive. If you have an untrained interpreter there, they're prone, prone to soften up uh, harsh words or uh, perhaps even racial slurs, things like that. Trained interpreters would not do that. As, as uncomfortable as that might be, if the person says a, a bad word, an insult or something, they have to let it out. Why do you think that might be useful? 
it might change, you know, change the way that individual responds to the person who's mm -hmm. talking to them. Exactly. It might change the whole interaction. So as uh, hesitant as we might be of, about saying something that might seem inappropriate, an interpreter should be faithful to the message. If it's a court word, if it's, a, if it's a, um, um, an insult, those have to come out. Mm -hmm. So it actually takes some training to, to be able to do that more than if you, I mean, the, because our na natural tendency would be like, oh no, I don't want to say that word, I don't care, I don't like to say that. Um, so, and again, it, it gets a little tricky sometimes if you don't know that, okay, the interpreter is simply speaking, is interpreting for the person uh, and not for themselves. Sometimes providers forget that and they look at you like, why are you saying that? So anyway, so this is this is a this is a, a canon that um, is not doesn't apply to, to law, the other person. Also, it doesn't apply cultural competence necessarily. The only way that cultural competency interacts in in um, the legal setting is uh, when you know the vocabulary from a particular region and you are uh, adapting it culturally to to the target language. So. In Central America, for instance, we all speak Spanish, but there are, there are many different words that, that mean different things in different countries. So this is the only aspect of cultural competency that would apply to, 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 um, to a legal setting. Just, okay, he's saying palabrero, and he's from Honduras, let's do the brokerage there, or let's, let's clarify with that person what do they mean by palabrero, because palabrero in Colombia means different than what they might mean, right? So that's the only instance where they do cultural competency in, um, in, um, in law, and in healthcare, it, it operates basically the same. But um, I don't believe that cultural competency is an aspect uh, I mean, it is a limited aspect of the of the of of the interpreter's performance in the law, but it's not even a canon in the in the set of um, in the, in the code of ethics for for court interpreters. It's not a canon. This only applies to healthcare. So when you um, when you recruit an interpreter for any purpose, um, it's useful for you to know what is available as far as credentials. There are two credentials that are nationwide that um, help, that can be used in healthcare and in other uh, public services settings, like um, well, perhaps schools and, and other things, uh, other settings like that. That are the the national the national certification given by the Certifying Commission in Healthcare Interpreting, or CCHI and the National Board of Certification of Healthcare Interpreters. Those are the two only certifying bodies in the United States. There is a difference between being certified and having a certificate of completion, right? A lot of interpreters don't understand this very well. And they might present to you, you know, language line, they pass a test, that's not a certificate. That's not a certification, that doesn't make them uh, certified interpreter. That just means they completed some kind of certificate program. So it's tricky because I don't think um, often they, they don't intend to misrepresent their credentials. They just don't know that that's not an actual certification, right? Uh, so if you are an, an end user, it's helpful for you to know that there are only two in the country for, for healthcare. As far as legal, there are the state court certification, which might be different by state, and the federal court certification that is nationwide. And um, for immigration, um, they have a specific exam. It depends on um, who has the contract for the immigration uh, interpretation. Right now, it's a company called SOSI. So they have their own exam, right? So if you need somebody to interpret for you and they don't have, so though a lot of these uh, or, or none of these are, are mandatory in the private sector. You might not want to have a, um, a person that's certified, right? 
but at least you should try to find someone that has been trained, even if they are not certified. So the fact that they are certified means that, means, means that they have the minimum requirements to have even taken the, the exam, right? But if they are not certified, that doesn't mean that they cannot perform the job. Then the next step is to find out what kind of training they have. So the, the basic training for, for interpreters is 40 hours. That means like 30, um, three credits um, of either healthcare or legal. So 40 hours of either. And in this training, usually what happens is that they are, they are being trained in the different modes of interpretation, uh, which are um, a consecutive, um, simultaneous, um, or side translation. So the consecutive mode is, is the one that you use the most in a legal encounter when you are, if you speak, then there is a pause and then there is a, an interpretation. That's the consecutive mode. The simultaneous is when the two persons are speaking at the same time. We see that a lot in state courts and the immigration courts when the person is using a device and they are simultaneously interpreting to the person. In healthcare, simultaneous interpreting happens uh, in, um, in uh, certain situations, like when there is an emergency and there is no time uh, or there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things happening, then they might use the simultaneous mode. So in these kinds of trainings, they, are, they learn uh, and develop those skills. They learn the code of ethics. So if you have somebody that has at least that training, you have certain assurances, certain, certain, certain guarantees, like they have a code of ethics, for instance. Because at least in healthcare, um, it's not mandated by anyone, but some hospitals now are requiring that the interpreters are certified by either the CCHI or the National Board of um, Medical Interpreters. And for the court, you definitely cannot interpret unless you have the state court certification or what they, they call credential. So if you are credentialed by the court, means you have met some requirements. And then if you are certified by the court, means that you pass an exam in which they tested your ability to interpret in the, mo in the different modes of interpreting, the simultaneous um, consecutive and side translation, and that you have a over 75%, I think, level of accuracy, meaning you might need some words, but you, you got the message across, right? And federal court certification is much harder to get. Um, the speed at which the interpreter is tested is, um, is faster than state court certification. And uh, there are fewer federal court certified interpreters. I think it's in the 900s, whereas healthcare certificates and certified interpreters are in the thousands. But it makes sense. I mean, it's more likely than out of the 25 million people of LEP, they go to the hospital more often, we hope, than we are involved in the court, right? But for immigration, though, the numbers are huge, right? So, uh, but the, in the, the, the exam for immigration court is uh, very similar to the state exam. It's just the vocabulary is different. So that's another important thing about uh, interpretation is that you specialize, right? So a, a person in the medical field might not feel comfortable interpreting in the legal field and vice versa. And also, if you, if you have a, an interpreter and you want to use them for a conference or at, an, a, a, at a particular topic, that interpreter needs to prepare for that topic because they might not be exposed to the words and the, and the different expressions. So I might have been an interpreter for very long, but if you ask me to interpret for like fracking, I will be miserable, right? <laughs> that was one that I was like, oh, thank you. I don't think I, I can do that. Uh, which is part of your code of ethics, knowing when you cannot do that. Uh, so interpreters do sub-specialize um, depending on their interest. Are there any questions about this? Okay. <laughs> if, I just uh, welcome anyone who might be listening to the webinar. If you do, you're you're all muted. I don't know if we said that at all, but you are. You probably
probably have figured that out by now, but if you do have questions, you can um, type them into your chat box and we'll be able to see them. Okay, so um, we have many different ways to, to access language services, right? Uh, in a lot of places, they help their own staff get qualified to interpret sometimes uh, because, you know, they are bilingual, they might as well just get the training and be able to interpret when needed. So that's one way. Um, then you also have to, to translate the vital documents. And then there is the remote interpretation. Mari is just an example of a service that is already available in the marketplace to do video remote interpreting. Um, video remote is being used in courts and healthcare services. It's less expensive, obviously, than uh, on-site interpretation or, or in-person interpreting. So there are, and there is telephonic interpreting too. I don't know why we didn't do that. Um, so one thing I want you to consider is that just as much as we try to sort of borrow ideas and standards of practice from um, healthcare to use them in, in, in um, legal settings, there is one big, big, aspect of um, provision of services that is the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, and the question is what is the what is the obligation of healthcare providers under the ADA for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing right and they do have to provide sign language interpreters so um, the reason why I put this here is because we can learn a lot from the from the way Today, the uh, provision, of the services to people with with um, that are deaf or hard of hearing are provided, and it's sort of it, 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 the idea is for us to reflect on um, how can we even uh, adapt what is already happening for them. And one idea is that okay, they have they have it figured it out. I mean, they have um, if you if you go to any place, uh, even the theater, we have um, American Sign Language. They provide these services very effectively and very efficiently. And I know that uh, being limited English doesn't make you necessarily um, disabled. But for the purpose of communication, it has an impact. So it's an idea. It's just an idea. Let's try to see what is good about this piece of legislation and see how we can adapt and um, also how we can make sure that it is uh, equally provided, so that, it will, that we're really providing equal um, care to everyone that is involved. So, and then I, I posed the question, I, I was hoping that perhaps if people were hearing that they would interact with this, because I'm gonna run through the material probably the next 15 minutes. <laughs> That's good. We'll have, I mean, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions. Okay. Yeah. So the question would be, in what situation should a public service provider obtain, obtain the services of an interpreter? So again, if the um, an interpreter should be present in all situations in which the information exchange is sufficiently lengthy, lengthy and complex to require an interpreter for effective communication. And just uh, to emphasize what I was uh, saying earlier, um, this is so these are some of the aspects of um, what what kind of background do you need for an interpreter. Again, if you don't have a certified interpreter, then what's the next best? Fluency in at least two language with training, at least 40 hours of training uh, in interpreting uh, or other professional training. So some people might have a, a certi 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 certificate of completion of the 40 hour training and some people might have gone to University of Maryland and have completed their master's degree in that. Both um, are good. That they follow a code of ethics and, um, and that you know that their role is to support the communicative autonomy, meaning um, they are not 
speaking on behalf of the patient they are, or the person that you're dealing with. They are just voicing what they are saying. So this, this is an important aspect of empowering the, the limited English proficient person. It's not really up to the interpreter. It's more to the person. The interpreter is there just for the communicative autonomy of both parties. Where are some places that an interpreter could get that 40 hours of training? Well, uh, equal access is one place. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other places um, um, that offer it. Nationwide, there are a lot of places. And um, I could send you more information. Locally, um, there are, we, we have equal access. We have uh, cross-cultural communication. Um, those are the one, uh, bridging the gap is one that is up in Seattle. Those are the ones that I know the most. Okay. And I, I train with cross-cultural communication. Um, and we have, a, I am a licensed trainer for the 40-hour training. Um, but I'm developing sort of my own equal access, equal access or no, language as an equalizer is, is, a, is another 40-hour training that has more elements of more public services. Because what is happening, or at least the, the, the way I'm conceiving this, um, is a departure from what, is, what currently exists. So what currently exists is, that is some term called community interpreting. And then there is legal interpreting and the other thing. And Community interpreting in, um, covers all the services that are for the community, but there is always this huge question mark on legal interpretation. Is it, is it part of community interpreting or not? So the way the reason why I depart from that concept is to go to public service interpreting. Because public services definitely involve um, a, the legal setting, right? Mm -hmm. um, the courts are a public service. And it takes away the hierarchy that, that exists currently with regards to interpretation. There is, I wouldn't know, there is like a class, more than a hierarchy is like, okay, uh, community interpreters are conceived as somehow um, less quality or uh, there, there is a connotation there that they are not as, as sharp as a law, as a legal interpreter, right? So I'm trying to take that away because I believe that you should provide absolutely outstanding interpreting services, regardless of the person you have been in front of, right? If it's a judge or if it's a, an LEP that is a, a um, victim of crime, it shouldn't make any difference. What I have seen in, in the field is that, oh yeah, no, she, Maybe this interpreter is good for community, as if it was something less. Mm -hmm. And I believe that high quality interpreters should be given across the board. So for some reason, I think that that is having an impact on the way people conceive community interpreting. And I, I would, my goal is to change the concept to uh, conceive it more as public services. And um, perhaps, I mean, perhaps it will work, but <laughs> my hope is that it works and that if you see it from that perspective, um, then you, you take away those interferences as, as far as uh, levels of quality and levels of importance. I think they are both equally important. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so, you know, you think of a, a lead court interpreter as being someone who's there in the court interpreting at a court proceeding, but so much of what lawyers do and what our volunteers do happens outside of court too, you know, like just kind of the meetings with the clients and also like, you know, settlements that you might work out outside of court. And like a lot of it is more like, it's not exactly what I think of as someone like standing in a courtroom interpreting, which I imagine is kind of what the legal training and the court certification is looking at more mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, and I, I have noticed that there is a certain attitude, uh, even among my students uh, that, oh my God, I was an interpreter for a healthcare uh, um, encounter because I'm a conference interpreter. Or, you know, it's like a, a, a class kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, based on comments I have heard throughout the years about, oh, you know, this person, she speaks a lot of Spanish. She, she can be like, um, she can work with the community. It's like, why? <laughs> why being from the community makes you less entitled to understand the service that's right. right. It doesn't make any sense, but yeah. there is there is this concept. Yeah. 
So I'm hoping that by by sort of conceiving from from a different point, it might change that attitude. Uh, because actually, mm -hmm. certain conference interpretations are community interpretations. Mm -hmm. So if you are, for instance, interpreting for a church, you have if you're a conference interpreter, you have the training to do simultaneous, but you are at a public service situation like mm -hmm. a church, right? So these levels or or these um, structures are false, they shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I think the reason is because, the reason for these different levels is because the requirements are, are harsher or, or harder than the, in, in, the, in a legal setting, right? So if you are, in fact, if you are a federally certified interpreter, that means that you have a great, uh, um, that you, that you're really, really excellent in the both languages, that uh, you probably have a super high speed at which you interpret, that you have high level of accuracy, right? Um, and that's why they select you uh, for federal court interpreter, interpreter, because the stakes might be different. I'm not saying higher, because I think that, you know, freedom is definitely um, an issue that is uh, of great importance, but at the same level, I think a surgery and something that can be can impact your life or the, you know, the rest of your life is very important too. So there are levels of the, the, the requirements enforced in interpreters, absolutely, but um, that's, that doesn't mean that um, the receiver of that service should receive something of lesser quality. I don't know, and, and this is, this is a, um, um, thinking that I am constructing as, as I go along. So it's, it's not fully formed yet, but it's, it's where I'm aiming. And um, language as an equalizer is about that. It's about conceiving it different and, and preserving quality uh, across the board. And again, it all depends on the context might have different stakes. And again, uh, uh, certain public services like healthcare, education might be centered in the person uh, patient-centered or student-centered care or approach where everyone in the encounter is looking in the same direction. But in, in a legal setting, not everyone is looking. It's an adversarial encounter, not a friendly encounter. So the stakes are different and they, that's why the responsibilities are different, but the quality should not be different. So, so um, I guess I, I kind of covered this already, but these are some things that you, you need to know about language, right? That is a part of culture that's complex and extremely relevant. If one of the things I am also bringing up in, in my training um, of language as an equalizer is that current concepts of cultural competency um, describe the ability to understand and communicate uh, effectively with people across cultures, right? Mm -hmm. But in the concept, it is assumed that these encounters occur within the same language. So language differences are not directly tackled. So for me, the most important thing about being culturally competent is providing adequate language services, right? Then the next thing is simply that bilingualism is not enough to be an interpreter. It's obviously a, a, the basic requirement and if you remember the, the intoxicado versus intoxicated example, there are many, many false cognates, in, in, especially in English and Spanish, and they can be very, very dangerous, not only in healthcare encounters, everywhere. Mm. Um, language services are a safety issue in, in healthcare, and in justice, it's a due process issue. Now, let's talk a little bit about translation. So, the um, the fact that you're an interpreter doesn't make you a translation a translator. It is a different set of skills. You you might be both, uh, but the assumption that an interpreter can do translation is an incorrect one, because the skills are completely different. The interpreter hopefully he knows exactly how to spell every word in in both languages, but that may not even be the case as long as they have the grammar to communicate and do so effectively. Whereas a translator has, has to 
know about Go languages and have, has to know other rules about the language, like for instance, capitalization uh, of um, in the in both languages, just to give you an example. Mm, um, in Spanish, we have fewer words that are capitalized compared to English. Uh, that might be relevant in some documents. Um, but the issue with the cognates are very important, right? So for instance, the word billion in English. We have the word billion in Spanish, but the difference is three zeros. So if you say billion and you interpret that or you translate that, let's say, and beyond, for the reader in Colombia, you are talking about uh, 12 zeros to the left. Let's say you're talking about dollars. Whereas in, in, in English, you're talking about nine zeros to the, I'm sorry, to the right, not to the left. So the, imagine that difference is a very important uh, cognate. And both interpreters and translators should, should know the difference. But the translator, once it's written, it's sort of like, can't go back, right? But th they are, a, they, when they go to school for translation, they learn usually something that is called um, localization, which means if you are uh, writing a document for a particular market, you have to keep into consideration the, how that product is going to be perceived in the, in the market, right? Uh, there are a lot of more nuances in translation uh, as far as uh, how it looks. So capitalization, grammar, uh, sometimes um, uh, also the fact that translation can be delayed. I mean, you can take your time and, and, and uh, use your, 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 your dictionaries and your other sources of research. So the, the skills um, are completely, completely different. And also what it is required from a translator in, um, in the legal setting or, or in the medical setting is also different. So for instance, the courts nowadays, immigration courts less and less are accepting translations by the attorney, right? In fact, in the manual uh, issued by the EOIR, um, attorneys should not do their own translations. Yet I see that still, every day. But I think judges are catching on to that. It's like, you shouldn't be translating for this client. You should use an outside source. And uh, um, as far as the requirements for the court it is sufficient that somebody can certify and say, you know, I certify that I am bilingual and that this was, this is a faithful translation from the original. That's all they require. But there are other there there are um, other requirements or other levels of of quality for translation. There is a, um, another certification that is called or there is a certification provided by the American Translators Association that um, makes you a certified translator, right? So you have to go to a different kind of testing. You, you generally speaking, you will translate two documents um, into one language from one language into another. And also, translators are of, often specialized into one language. So, for instance, I might be a translator into Spanish, but I may not have enough of uh, enough language skill as a translator into English, for instance. So sometimes you go from your your dominant language. I'm sorry, from your second language to the not to your dominant language as a translator. It is unlikely to find translators that are certified by APA that are in both directions. That's unlikely. So you might find that Christina does um, Spanish to English, but that you do English into Spanish. But usually the same person doesn't do both because they need to pass each exam into the language. I'm sorry if I missed this. What is the, what kind of certifications exist for translators? The American Translators Association certification is one. It's okay. very hard to find. Um, but there is a directory of the American Translators Association certified interpreter. So, for instance, uh, so for instance, if you go to a language company, you just have to tell them what kind of requirement you have. Again, the court don't require that to have a translator that is from the American Translators Association. They might require that the translation that you provide, let's say it's an immigration case, 
that the person certifies that they did a faithful translation. And the person could be anybody. All they ask for is that they're bilingual. I mean, it's a lower standard, but that's the standard that exists. And definitely don't, don't the, do it for your own clients. Even if you are doing in both, it, the court will not. Uh, well, I shouldn't say the court, but I have seen uh, um, judges um, calling out lawyers when they are when they did the translation. That's because interesting. I, I'm not bilingual, so I haven't come across you know tried to do that, but I didn't know that that was a um, like a best practice. So that's interesting. Yeah, they yeah. should. They definitely should yeah. do it themselves because again, how do they know they're learning yeah. unless they have been tested? And more and more courts are like demanding that you are tested mm -hmm. if you are going to have any issues about the language. Any other questions about translation versus interpretation? So how do you work with, with interpreters? Just um, I think we, we already covered this. Uh, level of proficiency, prior experience, educational background or training, and the status of the certification license. So in the encounter per se, some of the things that you can do um, is first to acknowledge the interpreter as a professional in communication, um, respecting his or her role. In the video that I mentioned there that, is, that um, I produced for Hopkins, one, one thing that tends to happen is that a, the person that speaks the language is like, oh, don't worry, I I learned Spanish in you know in Costa Rica. It was two months over there. I learned Spanish, and that's what they tell the interpreter. And my question is like, how would they feel if I tell them my dad is a doctor? Uh, he taught me how to put injections, mm -hmm. and I tell the nurse, it's okay. My dad, is a I was just putting, I put the injection because I learned it in you know with my father. How would they feel about that? So flipping the script was very useful so that they they gave the the role. You know, more and more that role should be respected, but it should it should be a two-way street. I mean, you should definitely demand high quality from, from the interpreter that's providing the service. Uh, during the well, I put medical interview, but during the interview, you should always speak directly to the client, not to the interpreter again. The more transparent, the better. If you don't even notice there is an interpreter, that's an excellent thing. Your communication is with the client, not with the interpreter. And it is important because sometimes they they, they engage uh, either the provide the provider might want to engage with the interpreter and talk to them and where are you from and all that, and it gets tricky because the interpreter is gonna always interpret that, and so it gets it just creates confusion. Um, it speaks, it speaks clearly and with complete ideas. Sometimes people want to be kind to the, to the interpreter and then they, they go halfway and cut me sentence. That's not enough for the interpreter to actually know what they are trying to say. So always please speak complete ideas. And, uh, speak at an even pace in relatively short segments, pause so the interpreter can interpret. The other thing is get familiar with the interpreter's code of ethics and um, remember that their job is the communication autonomy. So um, it's to empower both parts, right? The other thing you, you can do is avoid patronizing uh, or infantilizing the client. Uh, I say this because I, I see this happening. A lack of English language skill is not a reflection of low cognitive function or lack of education. It, it happens. Uh, people tend to to think that the fact that you don't speak English perfectly means you're dumb or something. Ask the client to repeat back important information that you want to make sure is understood. That is the most effective way to know that you're getting the message across. If you are, if, okay, what did I just tell you? Some, uh, and the, the person say, okay, uh, this is what I understood. You know the gaps, right? Now, interpreter cannot guarantee understanding, but you can guarantee that the message the message goes complete. Allow time, allow time for pre-session with the interpreter, meaning uh, when working with a uh, face-to-face -face interpreter, um, uh, you can talk to them. They, they will explain, okay, this is how uh, he's going to, 
happen. I'm speaking short sentences. They're going to give you all of this information prior. And they might ask you if uh, there is any information that they need to know ahead of time to prepare a like, uh, few words or something like that. Um, and remember the interface that's doing there for you and the client. So, and your client. So the interpreter is not only for the LEP, that was what we mentioned at the beginning, the interpreter is for both parties. So don't ever feel shy about, about that. It is, it is a two-way screen. And remember their creed, no omissions, no addition, no additions. So think about what you're gonna say because, because it's gonna be communicated. Um, sometimes people um, are annoyed that the person doesn't speak English and they have been here for 25 years and they're like, how come they don't speak English? That's gonna come out from the interpreter's mouth. So if you don't want your client to, to, to feel bad, don't say it, the interpreter will say it. And just um, before I conclude, I just wanted to leave, uh, to just present a short video to, uh, that I think is funny and it might sure. sort of go. So, so, okay, like, okay. Uh, Don, yeah. it's the language line to translate. Oh, Jesus, thank God. Okay, well, when, when can it come down? Right. Okay. They said they can't send someone until tomorrow. Just cannot wait. We need to take care of this right now. Do not let them off the phone. See if maybe we can just tell them what she's saying and then it can translate it for us. We're going to try to tell you what she's saying. Okay. Mahoba Kinyam. Mahoba Kinyam. Mahoba Kinyam. Mahoba Kinyam. He said that doesn't mean anything. Chum Chim Nakin. Chum Chim Nakin. Chum Chim Nakin. You gotta go up. Chum Chim Nakin. He said that doesn't mean anything either. Yum and Banta. Kim Yam at Ban Mahoba Kim Yam at Kal. Kim Matu Chet Mahoba and say, you want to check Mahoba and say, oh, be a chan. Kim Matu Chet Mahoba. She wants to look at this building and throw me back. Show my chai, throw me back. Show my chai, throw me back. Show me chai, throw me back. Throw my pine, throw me chan. Show my chai, throw my pine, throw me chan. Rumbum chai, chucky chai. Show me back. Throw me back. Says that doesn't mean anything either. Okay, you know what? Put it on speakerphone. Put it on speakerphone and then they can hear her directly. I think that's it. How do I do that? Press hold and then intercom and then line. What, 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 what? Whatever line. Just but, but how do line. I know which line? Because it's it's blinking. You'll see it blinking. What and blink? It's flashing in front of you, Denise. Can you see it flashing? The whole phone is flashing. I don't know how to so, this. You know, okay, hold, hold, hold the phone up. Thank hold you. it out as far as you can, and then you'll hear what she's saying. And tell them it's something Chinese. If you think it's something Chinese, that's a good one. That's got to be something. Get that. Good. He says, she says, I can't stand this. I wish I was dead. Please kill me. It's Khmer. She's Cambodian. Cambodian? <laughs> I knew it was something Cambodian. like that. All right. So, yeah, to, to uh, finalize, I just want to remind everyone that limited English is not a disease. If language is not a barrier, limited English proficient persons can be agents of changing their own lives. And with that, I'm gonna leave some links that are useful. Uh, this is basically where I uh, got the, all the research from. And I encourage you to visit those sites. And this is my contact information if you have more questions. Thank you so much for, for being here. And um, should we should we double check Kristen yeah. one more time with yeah. those questions? I, I think that thing lighting up might yeah. be that there is. Yeah. the program that I Thank wanted to ask. Andy Zelandia, where, how can I obtain a copy of the slides from the presentation that I might go to the materials again? So we will be posting this on our YouTube page and on our website within the next day or two. So you should be able to access it there. Awesome. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And that's if you go under um, mvlslaw.org, recorded trainings, um, or it's volunteer recorded trainings it'll be under there and i also um yeah so any questions please uh, please email me um and i i don't know can i ask answer can i answer any questions from you oh i'm sorry let me add yeah, one more thing sure. about if you um as a participant in the training we have your email as well so we can send follow-ups to everybody once the link's available 
Well, again, thank you so much for being here. It was a really valuable training. I know it answered a lot of my questions, <laughs> so I, I do really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, Christy, is there anything else you want to say about uh, PAN or MVLS to kind of oh. wrap up the training? Well, sure. Um, we were very excited to have Carol here today because uh, we think that this is just such an important skill for attorneys to have. and. Um, we hope that this encourages people to um, potentially take a case with um, a limited English proficient client because we definitely have we definitely have those clients mm -hmm. who are in need of representation. Um, and this could be for, especially for younger or newer attorneys in CAN, which is um, Community Advocacy Network. Uh, this could be a really important skill to start building in your career. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for participating and for listening to to uh, the two hours of training. I was it was my pleasure to be here. And um, yes, anything, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can just click stop broadcast. Yeah. I think it's a little too much. It's like a television cast. Nope. <laughs> Someone can see your screen now. No, oh, I no, think. <laughs> <laughs> um,